even things like once a week, I'll still pick up an anatomy book and go, let's look at the ankle this week. Next week, let's go. Because I, I can't spit that, those words out just like this. I've got to keep reminding myself, you know, with this stuff as well. So I, it's very important to have that learning curriculum up the side. Keep learning. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one fitness and performance resource in Switzerland. Today, I'm happy to welcome on the show Nick Ward, who is the Sports Performance Director at Altus. Nick, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks very much, Sean. Appreciate you, uh, you having me. My pleasure. For people who don't know you yet, could you please just talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you got there? Well, you know, I set a world record for an introduction on the Pacey Performance Podcast recently. So let's see if I can go, go the other way on this. And uh, yeah, my, my role has changed recently with Altis uh, to be the programs director. And, mm. um, you know, the way the world sort of pivoted and spun, uh, very heavily engaged in the education and developing the content uh, for our education and our coaching resources. Um, I've been in the game 25 years, um, you know, started coaching at the age of 14 um and uh you know started even teaching at the age of 17 and uh you know did my master's degree at the university of calgary which followed my you know my undergrad degree in newcastle so sports science kind of background um always sort of loved the coaching side getting out there more than necessarily being the, the testing guy or the lab guy and um you know then um you know my career kind of moved me from working in newcastle upon tyne as you know as a gym instructor into sort of sort of um, you know development coaching roles in soccer mm -hmm. uh, to um, Calgary, like I mentioned, where I met Stuart McMillan uh, from Altis, and we set up our first kind of consultancy business there, working in both track and in soccer and with sort of multi-sport athletes. And then I came back uh, to do a short stint at the University of Northumbria as a physiology and biomechanics lecturer. I set up a couple of consultancies there, and then uh, moved on to University of Durham, which is probably the longest time I've ever held on to a job. Um, uh, Altish soon to take over that but that was wonderful <laughs> University of Durham was was uh, immense it was a time when many of us were you know part-time strength and conditioning coaches organizations were taking people on full-time so I had multiple consultants with Durham County Cricket Club the University Cricket Centre of Excellence Newcastle United Hartlepool United Northumberland Rugby England Netball uh, Sport England whole bundle of stuff plus you know 300 plus university students and teams and uh that was just an amazing time you know rebuilding facilities developing staff uh building stuff in the community as well um the lure of professional soccer came calling um, the coach from hartlepool went to sheffield wednesday that's where the roller coaster really started to begin and um you know i learned to survive um you know our profession uh, with ups and downs um, mm. but then Sheffield kind of became home um, after we all got fired from Sheffield Wednesday and start, linked him with um, the local semi-professional rugby league team Sheffield Eagles mm -hmm. and again started doing a lot of like, local stuff with developing athletes and amateur teams and uh, worked on a consultancy business for Sheffield Hallam University stayed there for a couple of years but the lure of Canada came back as I went on to become uh, the performance director for their Olympic bobsleigh skeleton team uh, for a couple of years. And then had to move back to England for family reasons, um, where I was lucky enough then to get the national lead for the Talented Athlete Scholarship Program for Strength and Conditioning, mm -hmm. which again was a, an amazing experience of three, four years, um, you know, coaching other coaches, developing programs, uh, working with a lot of national governing bodies at their kind of development level against a lot of kind of, you know, um, part-time development type stuff going on there as well. Um, and then, you know, as money changes and uh, funding changes, um, I figured, you know, I'd like to be the master of my own destiny. So I uh, set up my own company and uh, set up Nick Ward Sports Performance Limited, where I again had a number of consultancies there with Derbyshire Institute of Sport, which was a part-time one for uh, youth development, England Golf uh, as their national lead, uh, and also uh, Sheffield Eagles then sort of got a bit more serious and actually turned full-time. So it was an interesting transition to work with a team that was half part-time players and half mm. full-time players. So that was fun. Um, and then um, as their funding actually, their backer kind of pulled out and things sort of changed there, uh, Altis came calling and uh, landed me here in beautiful South Lake Tahoe in California. But for the last four years, I've been doing like a hybrid program 
uh, with the hospital for um, you know, sport performance, you know, injury rehabilitation, orthopedics, and also wellness in the community as well. It's uh, great how it's sort of branched into those areas. Um, so still here in South Lake Tahoe, working on these other programs for Altis and uh, yeah, having, having a lovely time in this uh, wonderful environment that I've been so fortunate to find myself in. Yeah, that's, that's quite the background. So I'm interested in, in kind of digging into applying speed training and all the principles that you guys teach at Altis in the amateur sports framework, amateur field sports more specifically. We're going to talk rugby, soccer, uh, maybe other popular sports that are played uh, in that way. Uh, but before that, I want to come back on your, on your background a little bit. So you've been in the industry for 25 years now, like you said. You've had experiences across multiple sports on many different continents, different organizations, different levels. Can you talk a little bit about how things were done maybe in the past that you've experienced and what are the main changes that you see uh, today in 2020 and how things are, are, are done in, in terms of sports performance? I think I'm denying the fact that I'm going to be 50 this year. So it's actually probably more than 25 years. <laughs> I'm probably just counting it from, from the master's degree onwards being legit. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I think there's two, there's two things. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that the roles have changed, of course. Um, there appears to be way more jobs available now than back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's more formal titles. I mean, I've been called everything from training physiologist to fitness coach to rocket scientist to, you know, I mean, strength and conditioning coach is probably the last, you know, the, the, the jobs and titles change. And sometimes people are changing those to create a little bit of a nuance. I think, um, you know, so that, that's one thing that the, the apparent availability of jobs and roles have definitely, definitely increased. Mm -hmm. um, where we get our information has changed and, and kind of ebbed and flowed as well. Um, you know, most of my information would obviously come from research journals. Um, there's way more sports performance content available now than there was. I mean, my lecturer at Northumbria University, Phil Hayes, you know, used to literally uh, grab a few of us and walk us to University of Newcastle because they had a medical library mm. where we could pick up the Journal of Applied Physiology, act to scan, you know. So really for us, a lot of our physiology and biomechanics and coaching background came from those really solid sources so maybe I'd say we've, we've gone to maybe context a little bit too quick in sports science. Maybe now everything is very applied mm. and maybe we're, we're forgetting some of the, how long some of these other disciplines have been around and sometimes we might need to underpin some of our knowledge with some, maybe just one of a better word, more solid science. I think Sophie Anunfius actually mentioned that in the Need for Speed course where she said, you know, sports science seems to be scared about laying down theories. It, it tries to go to the truth a little bit too quick, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as well. So where we get our information from has massively changed. I mean, I used to get photocopied articles off Dan Path with his handwritten notes on, which was amazing, right? You know? Yeah. Um, and we were also getting a lot of the Eastern German, uh, East Euro European kind of literature kind of snuck through Right. as well and people would go to other conferences and you just had to have this kind of stuff but also um social media obviously has changed things massively i don't think necessarily as coaches we talk and interact as much which is why podcasts like yours are fantastic that we're doing this hmm. um the uh, an example would be i mean i could come home from an eight nine hour day and then uh, paul winsper who was the newcastle um head sort of fitness coach for a whole number of years, uh, works for Under Armour now. Mm -hmm. um, we could spend another three hours on the phone with each other. Yeah. <laughs> but we were concocting stuff, you know, challenging each other on things. So, you know, that, that was always really, really nice to have, have those regular conversations too. Um, what else has changed? Um, I think the technology has changed um, for good and for bad. Um, things that we have available to us. I remember in 19... About 1999, 2000, I think I got one of the world's first um, velocity measuring systems called the Globus Real Timer, which mm. was actually built by Bosco uh, himself. And, you know, I started to play around with that and I thought, hey, this is great. This is going to tell me a lot more 
Uh, but then you start hitting those snags of how do you incorporate it into yeah. what you're doing? And uh, hey, I should have stuck with that one, right? I could could have invented something that attaches to a bar or something. I earned a lot of money out of that uh, <laughs> to create velocity measurements. Um, so I do think the technology's changed quite a bit. Um, you know, I mean, it's, I'm, not, I'm making that kind of sound like everything has sort of got worse. No, it hasn't got worse, of course. You know, I think everything is about how we critically think and apply. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe I would say that with all this extra advantage of more of us doing stuff, so there is more information, um, maybe just our ability to sieve um, the information because um, we want quick hit info is, is maybe just needs to be addressed a little bit um, in what we're doing. But of course, sport performance and sports science now having sort of, I guess, I want to say I got involved in the early days, but when I started, there were old grumps like me around, you know, like my you know, late departed professor, Edward Winter, who, who uh, was, was a great mentor for me and recently um, passed away from Sheffield Hallam University. You know, other, other professors, you know, Dr. Dave Smith in Canada. You know, there were these people that have been around trying this stuff for mm. a lot of years before us. And, and I think in a time, maybe this is my third thing, in a time when it was almost like coaches and the scientists were mates, they were pals. So they had great conversations out of which some really good things materialized. Mm. And maybe one of, one of my things now, and maybe it's coming back round again, but the ability of those of us who maybe come from the scientific academic background, but are in the coaching roles, being able to build those relationships and have those conversations with the coaches. So there isn't yeah. a brick wall between us. And I think we're getting there again now, you know, in, in building those relationships, but there's been a big dearth, I think for quite a long time, especially where sports science has been so focused on publishing and getting mm. articles out that and I remember sat down in a, in a meeting with Owen the podium with the Canadian national teams and Phil Halverson, who was the performance director for the speed skating team at the time. Uh, there was all this money available for what they call top secret research and all these proposals were on the table. And he literally said, I won't do his accent. I normally, when I tell this story, I do his accent, but I won't. Uh, I sound like a character from the Muppet show. Um, he basically said, I like the, all these proposals, but where are the ones from the sport? Right. They were all from the scientists, you mm -hmm. know, about what they thought was important, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that gap started close. So there was no gap. People were pals. Yeah. Everyone went off to their white ovary towers. We stopped speaking and communicating in the same language. Yeah. Um, and now maybe that's just moving that way again, which I think is vitally important in our roles to, to have those relationships with the coaches. So it's interesting. You're, you're saying that you see that kind of uh, communication pathway opening up again between maybe more the coaches and the researchers. Uh, for, for coaches that, who are not involved in an organization where there are researchers maybe on site or in close quarters in terms of working with them, what would you recommend uh, for, so that we can, you know, like you said, try and bridge that gap again, try and reach out. Who do we reach out to? Where do we look for those people? And how do we get the conversation going? Because like you said, sometimes the researchers have their own opinions on what needs to be done. And then the coaches see it completely differently because they're they're on the field so how do we how do we get that conversation going so I, I would take two two approaches to this um one is you're in your role or roles and jobs so directly and immediately in front of you you've got those people you need to network and communicate with but also you know you've left your education now and as we know as soon as we leave education where do we get our resources from right we we can't get the journal papers anymore but so and then I'll caveat that in a second. So I think you've still got to build your own learning curriculum as well at the side. So you've got the learning that's going to come from you doing your job, so the on-the-job learning, mm. but still set yourself up. Because, you know, you leave your undergrad or your math, you don't know everything. What are your areas of weakness still? Still profile yourself, still build that up. And that may be directly training and coaching relevant. It might be business skills. Mm. It might be other skills that you're looking at. You know, so I did a lot of business training and stuff like that. But even things like once a week, I'll still pick up an anatomy book and go, let's look at the ankle this week. Next week, let's go. Because I, I can't spit that, those words out just like this. I've got to keep reminding myself, you know, with this stuff as well. So I, it's very important to have that learning curriculum up the side. Um, keep learning. And a you know, research gate is great. That's a great resource to find stuff. 
Um, the, obviously, there's, there's a lot of social media stuff that you can find research articles. But what we're talking about is building those connections with those researchers. Who can we talk to? Interestingly, I remember myself going, well, why do they want to talk to me for? You know, I was at a European conference in, in sports science. I think it was 99. I had a poster presentation there that I was doing in biomechanics with um, Dr. Dr. Kellis, where we, look at, we were looking at the synergies of, of muscles during fatigue. And um, I just went to speak to Pabo Comey and, uh, and Schmidt Bleicher, who were there. And many people hopefully know where they are. I mean, they're enormous people. If you haven't read Strength and Power in Sports and other stuff, they, these were huge people. And um, this is prior to me, um, you know, so just after me doing my master's degree, and they were wonderful people, you know. They 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 are excited in this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They love, you know, they love the questions. And you know, um, foolish to me, I didn't continue that dialogue with them afterwards because it was like, well, they're probably just messing around. They don't really want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. But what I found out is that they do. They 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 get excited by this, you know. And sometimes you have to be a little bit persistent. You know, but I would, you know, even some of the guys out there now in the UK that I would know, like Chris Bishop and Anthony Turner and those guys and, and Dr. Sophie and Infius and Matt Jordan in Canada, you know, th these people get excited when people take interest in their work. You know, mm -hmm. the main thing is res just respect it a little bit. Don't say, hey, can I have a bundle of articles off you, please? <laughs> don't, don't go with them saying, can you give me the answer to? Think of it again like your research project. Tell them the problem you're having. Set it up as a hypothesis. Tell them where you've already kind of looked. Don't go there and expect them to do all the work for you. So just mm. think about this, your style of approach. Um, and I think that will that seems to pay, pay dividends um, as well um, if you approach it in the right way. Then within your own teams and squads as well, look, Everyone's got a local college nearby. Everyone's got a local university nearby. Mm -hmm. You know, make those connections with them. You know, find, find out who's there, who's working. They're, they're, they're going to have some interest in, 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 in setting up a journal group, setting up uh, some kind of, you know, because everybody wants to expose their students to experience um, and give them those opportunities. So, um, you know, go and speak to those those organisations locally to you. And if there isn't anything immediately locally, what's in the region um, to go and speak to as well? Um, yes, that's that's what I would suggest there. Just be brave with it. I like I like the brave part at the end. Um, coming back on something you mentioned before, where we get our information from, what would you recommend to coaches in that realm? Because, like you said, there's so much of it now. There's too much to take in you know all at once so how how do you recommend that people maybe it's a bit of a weird question but maybe it makes sense to you how do you help people learn how to learn because we all have our own way of getting to uh, assimilating the information taking it in making our making it our own in a way so how might someone go about figuring out what the best process is for them in order to get that information in and not just again, just copy paste or just glance over and forget, uh, you want to retain something on the other side. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And um, it's kind of popped up in a lot of other areas I'm working in right now. If we talk about information exchange, mm -hmm. and, and in this case, the information exchange is from the plethora of information that's out there. And how am I getting that to come to me to impart in my brain that's going to make some kind of change to the quality of me as a person or as a coach? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think, oh, I just lost my train of thought quickly there. Um, one of those ways is to um, look at reflective practice. I think it's important to... Um, First five minutes of the day, you know, what are my aims for the day? End of the day, am I reflecting on my day for five minutes? Um, I, I, I was trying to pick one of my old notebooks up here. And, uh, you know, this is, I mean, I've got literally, you know, these are all <laughs> my notebooks, right? Because yeah. um, these are things that I will, you know, write down, reflect and, um, you know, and, and go back on at the end of the week. I, I actually use... Um, 
like uh, those those pens, all the different colors you have on them. Yeah. So, um, you know, if I if I got something in green, you know, it's still kind of active at the end of the week. If I can read it through, it's kind of a nice process to read stuff through that you've done it. Mm -hmm. but sometimes I'll, I'll highlight other stuff in blue that maybe I've sent to someone else uh, as well to kind of keep a track of. Um, but I think it comes in three kind of levels as well. The information exchange is about um, in, in space and time, how important is it that you know all that now and have that information now? Mm -hmm. This goes into decision making kind of pathways too. But, you know, is it crucial that I need this now? So therefore, it's got to be a priority, you know. And I will the wheels fall off the bus if I you know don't learn this stuff now. Um, is it just a nice to know, you know? Mm -hmm. So you know, yeah, I'm because you know we can all. But I'm the worst in the world for this. You can tell by the way I speak. Butterflying around, right? And the next shiny thing grabs your attention. Um, so a task I gave, I give a lot of my uh, coaches that work with me is um, get a bundle of post-it notes. And on your wall, you're going to have three headers. Now, next, and never. <laughs> so under all those, on all each individual post-it note, you write out the topics and things you need to know about. And you stick them under now, next, or never. Mm. Now is things will, will fall off the bus. Next, you know, I need to know, but it's not vital. The never, just the nice to know stuff, right? But what tends to happen is under the now, that's where the majority of your post-it notes go. Under the next, the next amount, and under never, there's a few. But the task is flip that around. Make more of those post-it notes under the never. Now, here's the funny thing. If it's that important, it's going to come back round again. Mm -hmm. it, you won't, you know, if it's that important, you will revisit something that was under that never list. Sometimes I call it the someday maybe list as well. Mm -hmm. um, something that my good friend back in England, Dave Hember, will know from a book called, I think it was called Get It Done, you know, how you'd organize kind of your inbox, your mental inbox mm -hmm. and all your systems around you as well. But that one post-it uh, activity, in terms of at least prioritizing what needs to get done, has been a favorite of a, of a lot, of, lot of our students as well. Mm -hmm. Me personally, one thing that massively helped me in my career was mind mapping. Tony Buzan, who um, passed away recently, um, because the way I work, I'm not a very sequential learner or reader. Um, so um, I think at the moment you've got Henry Barrera out there doing a lot of notes on the Need for Speed course, you know, using artistic forms and stuff like that as well. So that really helped me connect a lot of my thoughts and ideas together. And uh, what it meant was is that I had time to kind of digest the information rather than being so intense in it. So in a lecture, for example, or a podcast or something I'm learning online, I'm really just taking key words out of it. So I still get to listen. Mm. I think the skill of actually writing things down is something that a lot of learners have lost. I don't think we actually put pencil to paper enough and maybe someone out there can find the science, but I think that helps us retain things more. I think there's mm. got to be something in the art of looking and writing out stuff that, that helps us retain information. So prioritizing it, how to kind of organize the information that you're that you're gathering from the distant the, the simple uh, the, the different sources then i think there has to be an, an ongoing process of just recalling that so what mind mapping taught me was this idea of like the, th the, the 24 hour review the three day review the seven day review the one month review the three month review so kind of these things are just then uh calendarized Mm. Ironically, that same method became came into my sales later on as well, and how I would contact athletes and things like that as well, having right. those kind of checkpoints. Um, kind of, I thought that makes sense. If I'm doing that to retain information about me, why don't I do that with my athletes as well? Uh, if mm. I'm a communication strategy, so um, everyone will. I mean, the people talk about learning styles. Um, I think as a mentor, you just you know you you roll with that a little bit with individuals. Um, but I do feel again, just go back to the simple thing, the basics of, you know, maybe you voice record your notes and play them back. That's some of that I've introduced a few people to, mm -hmm. um, definitely make notes, um, organize your priorities, but also then have a process of, of returning back to that information. Um, so you're always kind of scaffolding and layering 
uh, the understanding of that up, especially as you come across new experiences, new contexts as well. You never quite know um, how some of that information becomes applicable in a different way. Yeah, I can definitely relate to what you said regarding putting pen to paper, although I don't handwrite a lot anymore, uh, but I do write on the computer and I do find that when I'm listening to something, if I take notes and then I work on rewriting my notes in my own words and try to explain things, even just to myself, it really helps solidify what I've gone through and actually just structure it in my own, in my own framework, I guess. Yeah, and I, the voice recording stuff isn't something that I've read on a lot of myself. Um, having, you know, been involved in a lot more virtual stuff over the last several months, of course, mm -hmm. it's been quite interesting listening back to yourself. Again, go back to Phil Hayes, when I was a university lecturer for a while, you know, he said, go record yourself doing the lectures, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, no, but actually, yes, it's, it's fascinating. And kind of the, my, excuse me for my office in the middle of making my office here, the beds dismantled, but because I've got the stand up desk now, I'm actually going to be able to probably, um, you know, do a little bit more of watching myself and listening to myself and picking up those cues. Um, like, um, I know I say that a lot already. I've picked that up. Um, <laughs> just to brush up on stuff like that. But even the ability to um, you know, record yourself given a mock presentation, you know, one of the tasks in the uh, Need for Speed course is people are learning on that right now. You have a huge opportunity to create a presentation as you're going through this. Mm. Why not do that, you know? Mm. But then maybe, you know, roll some of it back so you, you know, you're, you're just creating a deeper depth of that understanding. Um, as they say, uh, they do say those people can't teach. I think that's a bit unfair. Um, I think it's more about the best way to learn is to teach. So, yeah. you know, if you can create, um, you know, we've mentioned earlier, your local colleges. I mean, I, I'll be going into the college here to go and do a talk to their students uh, as well. Find opportunities. I mean, even in terms of my hands-on therapy work with people, um, my wife and my son, you know, and when I've done that week on looking at the ankle, I'm like, hey, lay, on, lay here, let me have a look at that a second. Because <laughs> what you're reading a book and what, you know, between an 18-year-old mm -hmm. lad and a 49-year-old lady, can I mention postmenopausal? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, there's different things. So, you know, just finding those opportunities, I guess, to, um, to be a bit practical with it as well. Um, and what I always like to say is try and then learn by doing. So when you've kind of read some stuff or took some stuff down, where in your environment do you have the opportunity to put that into context? Mm. Um, so we spoke earlier about the parallel learning curriculum, but learning in the environment itself. Don't leave them separate because sometimes this is going to drive what you need to know over here. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what you find here, this gives you the opportunity to give it a go. You know, right, right. one thing we often say at Altus is that, you know, we're pretty certain um, around 90% of what we do works. There's probably 7% that we're playing with and there's 3% we've got no idea on mm -hmm. um, as well. And, um, you know, maybe that 90% is high for us because of our years of experience and knowledge. But, you know, don't, don't be scared to have a little bit of trial and error, um, you know, in, in what you're learning and or how you're trying to apply things. Yeah, it's a, it's a breakdown that I've heard before, maybe from, from Stu, maybe from someone else that, you know, when you're programming, you want 70, 75% of things you're sure are going to work. And then you give yourself 20% of, or maybe less 10 you want to try. And then a fraction of, you don't know, you know, maybe it's a Hail Mary, but at least it won't, you know, compromise the whole program if this doesn't go through. Well, maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but that's, that's a really good example of how you need to modify your planning and programming in the amateur environment. Mm -hmm. You know, do you give one program to everybody? Absolutely not. But then it because everyone will say, well, I haven't got the time to hand over 30, 30, 40 players. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about that now? Or do you want to leave that to your line of question a little bit later? No, that was actually, I was, uh, I was waiting for a good segue. So you, you made my job easy here. So let's, let's <laughs> jump right into it. So the, the content, the main kind of line of questioning for, for this chat was around, you know, speed in, in amateur field sports. Uh, and so let's, maybe let's start from the, from the beginning with this. Why, why coach speed in amateur team sports? It, there's not a lot of time. Sport's very important. They need to practice. Why do we need speed? Because it's the most important thing. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
well first of all let's 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 just take a step back because people talk about speed i don't think i don't think people really know what they're they they mean by speed mm -hmm. try and understand uh what you mean by speed my sunlight's coming through right now <laughs> um let me just pull that curtain sorry <laughs> i go for it that better that's good yeah it's too dark now okay um the glare is fine no problem okay um yes speed me and you sat here right now, we're demonstrating speed. It's just slow, right? Right. The speed within our brain systems, the speed within our, our eyes are working. You're nodding your head there. I can measure how fast that is. Right. So when we're talking about speed, what are we really talking about, right? Often I think we, um, often we um, don't redefine it very, very well. Mm-hmm. You know, speed in team sports uh, has many subcomponents to it. Um, so let's understand what aspect of speed are we, what subcomponents of speed are, are we really talking about? You know, we, we kind of broke it down to three areas. There's the, what we call the enduring speed, the, the ability to repeat speed, the ability to hold speed mm -hmm. um, over the duration of a game or in, a, in an intense bout of play, you know, in rugby, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it could be, you know, ruck after ruck after ruck. You know, tackle situation, tackle situation and rugby league, you know, as mm. well. Um, that really is annoying me. I can't see myself, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, that's better. Perfect. Um, um, so, and also then the, the linear speed, right? When we're talking about acceleration and top end speed. Mm. Um, and then we go into the decision making you know, components of speed as well, uh, too. So kind of define, define what it is uh, you're looking for. And there's two ways you look at this, um, athlete first or game first. And this is where, again, the conversations with the, the coaches and the players becomes really, really important. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we rock up, people expect us to do our job. You know, you've got 30 minutes at the beginning. You know, and in my early days at Sheffield Eagles, I mean, that was it because I had other stuff on. I'd roll in, do my 30 minutes and go, you know. Um, that was pretty dumb, to be honest, you know, uh, you know, other pressures, you know, family and stuff like that as well. But, you know, gradually you're like, you know, you're going to get more out of hanging around and, and watching what's going on. But of course, in, in our sports, you know, speed isn't the only thing. We can argue that it's the, the most game changing element. It's the most mm -hmm. game determining, determining, determining element. But we're also looking at two things here, speed of individual players and speed of the team. Um, what's the, t the tactics that the coach is playing with? You get into that conversation with the head coach. Hey, tell me about your style of play. You know what? We're okay. You're in. You're letting them talk. Yeah. You know, um, some teams' style of play, as we know, both in soccer and rugby, is to stop the other team playing, slow them down. Mm. That's utilizing speed in a different way. Right. Taking other people's space. You know, to stop them playing is another thing to think about. But so within all that, you've got positions as well. What, what type of speed is it important for players to express in their positions? You know, our, our second rower, you know, versus our winger, clearly we don't have the same expectations, you know, of, of what, they, that what they do, you know, mm. in, in, in the role of the game as well. And so this also begs the question, and those of us who are working part-time, we have several, several contracts around, Think of it as like a three, two, one kind of approach. When you first start with a new contract, small or big, you've got to put about three times the amount of time into that than you're probably actually coaching. Once you get through that first cycle, then it's probably two times as much. And then when you get to that second cycle, it's probably equivalent planning to coaching. And mm. that kind of fits my three year rule if you're there that long. Um, but sometimes doing that initially well in the beginning, I remember with Hartlepool United, it was a, a, a one, one pre-season deal twice a week, then turned into, can we continue this in season? Mm. Then turned into, can you do the academy? Then turned into, can we do more? You know, so you, you got to allow these things to germinate a little bit. And part of that comes down to um, how much are you prepared um, to cultivate, to fertilize, to harvest, you know, these opportunities as well. 
going back to the amateur teams, look, we know it's not just about speed. It's, it's about what we call you know, KPIs, your key performance indicators. You know, what's going to win games? Um, what's going to develop a player the most? What may be a good way to uh, safeguard injury potential uh, in a player the most? Mm. Now you've sort of laid those topics out. What great conversations you can have with people. Go see the physio. Hey, yeah, see, he's had like several hamstring injuries. Tell me more about that. You know, um, you know show me sort of things that you might do to, to work on these. The tell me, show me is something that I picked up off John Berardi uh, doing his precision nutrition courses. And I think they really are two very, very powerful, inobtrusive ways to start some of those conversations. So... I guess with what I've just said, without getting off the topic of speed, is develop your context. Mm. Um, you know, build that first. So you start identifying the problems, and then you've got to say, okay, what's most important? You've got to put some kind of hierarchy in here of what's most important. Um, and then, then that's what you do. I then sort of say, right, okay, how do, I, how do I then look at delivering this? And I kind of speak about there's three three is my magic number by the way you'll get used to this but there's three things then one is um where's my fast lane here how do i how do i get some quick wins in in implementing my strategy so let's say now we have decided that speed is important mm. we've decided that um because of the need for our team to um disrupt the other team we want to get off the line. We want really good line speed. And that as a team goal is something we want to work on. So that immediately leads itself into that kind of starting speed, perception, action. What are we seeing out there in acceleration mm -hmm. uh, components? Extend that on. It's not just about me getting off the line. It's my ability then to break myself down and be ready for the next thing. You know, so you start looking at this problem a little bit deeper as well. That sun's moving around a little bit deeper as well. And, you know, you might say, well, my decision to get off the line is based on what I see here, what we think they're going to do. Well, actually, no, you just got to get off the line because now your decision is now you're here mm -hmm. and you play this, right? So now you're having great conversations with the coach and the players about how do they feel about that? What are they seeing? You, you start to bring in some deceleration mechanics into that as well so what you thought was a simple acceleration problem it's an hourglass right you think you've narrowed the problem down and you go whoa there's all this other stuff mm -hmm. so you you start looking at your hierarchy of kpis and prioritize those but you've got two sessions a week what are you going to do right mm -hmm. um this is your first year in with a team where's your quick win well clearly the warm-up is a great opportunity to to bring something in there mm. do you have weight room time with them or not or i mean again i guess part of this is are you the coach and those of you listening to this are you the coach that you don't even see them on the field you only have them in the weight room mm. i know for me with sheffield eagles all our weight room stuff was done 40 minutes before we went on the field with with soccer most of the time it was always after training or on days off mm. you had to kind of fit it in right. straight away your periodization theories are out the window there right <laughs> <laughs> it's what you've got you know exactly. yeah. but people what what do we mean by training right you adapt to an environment that puts you under a certain stress and you adapt to it mm. so the players adapt and also what i had in that um be ready to pull me back around in a second by the way i'm going on a tangent here Go for the it. other thing you think about with your players is that i had teachers i had firemen i had people who rugby actually was their full-time thing I had players who were concrete breakers, you know, coming in to train. Mm. So players would arrive between 5.15 um, and traditionally what they all did was line up outside the physiotherapist door. And I'm like, we've got to stop that. Those of you know the Altus performance therapy approach, like that isn't really what we're doing. I said, you know, physiotherapist, who are your priorities? <laughs> Right, get them in. Why, tell me why they're your priorities. Mm -hmm. Now, this was obviously at a point where I'd moved on to more of a performance kind of lead role that I could yeah. kind of, you know, have that little bit of authority and say that sort of stuff uh, as well. Um, but it became about, about self-management with the players, you know, but also because I brought a little bit of mindfulness into it as well. Come in, have five minutes of kind of like relaxation. I wasn't going to get them into yoga and stuff straight away, but just by going through some 
simple kind of basic Pilates, bridging exercises, you know, get them to breathe. I, I then later on, I wrote off that because we shared this track with um, Don Valley Stadium. So we had track teams in there. If mm. it's raining, we couldn't want the grass, but was, every session could have been chaos, right? <laughs> but I, I kind of roped out this area and I put a whiteboard up at the front saying, you know, you know, uh, only enter if you're prepared to get better. And it was like, if you want to mess around, fine, you know, whatever you've got to do, go and mess around over here. And, um, and that, that kind of worked okay to players not to come into that area if you're going to be a, be a bit of a prat, right? right, right. Um, only come in if you're ready to switch on and do stuff. So once they got in there, then I spent a lot of time individually, you know, going through the basics, right? You know, uh, tissue release, mobilization, you know, activation type drills and doing all that stuff at, at the very, very beginning of what we were doing uh, as well. Um, and then it's like, yeah, you know what? Let, let's, talk to the, let's talk to the physio about that. What was kind of interesting over a period of time is how many players started to come to me with problems because they didn't want to be missed, missed out of the game at the weekend, right? Because amateur players and semi-pros, they get paid when they play, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, the first thing I did, I cut that dead straight away. Have you spoke to the PT about that? Hey, Kay or Mick, come here. Because they'll, they've got to understand that you are a team as yeah. well, you yeah. know, at the same time. So we kind of formulated that sort of, um, we call it self-management, whatever you want to call it, movement preparation, warm-up, pre-warm-up, prehab, whatever, right? The, the goal was to get them some ownership. And sometimes I would do that in a very structured way. Mm. I built like a curriculum where I'd go, you know, let's foam roll, let's release, let's activate and do it in like a big circuit with everybody. Then I would kind of modulate how much I would input and maybe I'd just say, hey guys, I'm going to show you about the hips today and just focus on that. Mm. On other training sessions, I'd pull away. So that meant that I couldn't just turn up at my half an hour on the field. I was there beforehand. Now, I extended my time being there. You right. know? Um, again, if you're the weight room only guy, how do you build this into, well, hey, when you're running and sprinting, these are the shapes you need to find. So let's work on you here, trying to find those good running shapes, whether it's you know stiff ankle dorsiflexion, working on anterior pelvic tilt, making sure they've got good shoulder thoracic connection to the hips there's things you can kind of focus on mm. ask the players to give you some game video of how they run and what they see is important that that also helps too the other thing that i did there as well i used to have like two different colored matted areas like a there was like a basically a, a red matted area and I, I changed the color from red later it's like a blue mat but it basically meant as this player came in it's your responsibility to yourself to make sure you come with the right intention to train it's also your responsibility to your teammates not to be a prat and mess everyone else's sessions up. Right. So if you come into that area and you go and sit on that blue mat, the rest of the players know not to talk to you. Mm -hmm. You're there to sort yourself out before we actually then go and train or you're going to immerse yourself with the group as well. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. Uh, I think it's, it's a really interesting way yeah. of, like you said, um, making the players responsible for their own health in a way and their own preparedness for the game because it's easy like you said to just line out the door and, and just say oh i need to see the physio but what if you could you know do a bit more self-care before what if you had injuries yeah. you know hamstring injuries in the past and actually doing a proper warm-up would actually alleviate a lot of those recurring tidy niggles that you get all the time so i think it's a really interesting way of, of doing things of slowly yeah. building that in i wanted to come back to a point that you you mentioned early on communicating with the sports coaches and <clears throat> I guess it really depends really depends on what organization you're you're with but in, in the in the amateur realm let's say there's still quite a bit of resistance from the and again I'm generalizing but that's what I've seen so far quite a bit of resistance uh, from the sports coaches in regards to training speed in the in the preseason even in season do the guys actually need it do you really need all that time all that time I'm talking about like 15 minutes a week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so well, where do you, yeah. where do you, you addressed, you know, some of the communication means that we can use as uh, physical preparation uh, folks to actually start a, uh, a constructive conversation with the sports coaches. But where do you think the resistance comes from in the first place? But because like you said, if you start talking about the game, they'll tell you themselves that right away that speed is, 
is very important in in all aspects of the game, offense, defense, and and more. Mm. Um, so, lack of understanding and fear. Mm. Um, most people's resistance deep comes from fear, and that's fear of either being exposed as not knowing everything, and the head coach is the purveyor of all knowledge versus the head coach who recognizes they're the purveyor of all knowledge because of the staff they have around them. You know? So um, I remember having a conversation with Mark Aston, probably about my second year at Sheffield Eagles, and um, different to Newcastle United Academy, who were obviously a full-time academy, but I was with them three times a week, where with Sheffield Eagles, the three times a week I was with them were the only three times a week they trained. So conversations in both environments actually would span around what could the players do for themselves? Well, without an Irvin at Newcastle, it was always with the players. If they got time, they should be working on their techniques. You know, that's what they should be working on. Well, me and Mark spoke about coachability and trainability. How well the players train really comes down to their coachability on the nights that they're with us. And we had a conversation, we had, him and I had the conversation, which then led to a group session, which was, you know, we respect this is the time that you have, you come on these nights. This is the time we've got control of, but we'd like your input. And that was kind of weird to say to the players, you've got some input here. The other side of it is though, what do you do away from here to be a better player? How can we help with what you do? So as soon as you start talking to a head coach about finding more time to get better, they're like, oh, I like this idea. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of given the opportunity to recognize that, yes, you've got these pockets of time when you're together, but the majority of the time the players have to prepare themselves in the amateur environment to be the best they can be exists elsewhere. It doesn't just exist in those nights. So it's how to tap into the psyche of the coach and the players about the opportunity to improve and develop as a player exists in their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, their discriminatory time. Right, the time they choose what to do with themselves. So that could be arrive 45 minutes before the training session starts mm. and do some extras, as we used to call it. All right. It could be, uh, hey, I've got, a, I've got a Wednesday, I can do something else on what could I do, Nick? You know? Yeah. So we spoke about the coachability and trainability. And at academy levels, even, you know, again, part time clubs with Sheffield had a part time academy as well. What skills can players go away and practice? How does that? With academies, they often have club teams they could play for as well, right? So how can they take some of this to their club team? How do you as the coach of the team at the top of the pyramid, if you like, albeit still amateur, how do you go and see those other coaches, those other clubs? Because they're probably more open-minded at this point than your head coach here, right? <laughs> so how do you infiltrate there as well? So you start to kind of create this pyramid up so that and this happened with England netball as well when I worked with their regional squads it wasn't just about what they did with us once or twice a week it was about what they did when they went back to their clubs mm. so a bit of a tangent again but if you can create a little club network of stuff and conversations and get in with them you start making sure that the time your player spends here with you is multiplied by what they do at their club Mm -hmm. Now, on another side of this as well, it's the same with, um, with one of the uh, developments we did in the, in the Durham County area at one time. We literally had PE teachers, club co coaches from different sports, um, basically learn warm-ups. You know, it was the time of SAQ and stuff like that when that was around. But it was basically you learn warm-ups, learn dynamic warm-ups. I mean, you've got to remember when I started this, back, dynamic warm-ups were a no-no. It makes people sore, it injures people, right? <laughs> it was go for a jog and static stretch, right? you know, which even that baby shouldn't be thrown out the bath water. But there was still uh, – so to get across a region, Literally, these kids, both in their schools, in their club sessions, and in their academy sessions, where the warm-up now basically went from go for a jog or just mess about for 10 minutes until the coach was ready, because <laughs> they hadn't planned, um, to we've now got an extra 30 minutes a week of movement skills training. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, what is a warm-up? It's movement skills, right? And we're taking through people's ability to find shapes, develop patterns, create rhythms, in these you know even simple a march as you start going from a a march to a skip to a run mm. right it goes from shapes 
to patterns to rhythm, mm-hmm. you know, in, in that sense. So you start having this, you know, we're talking about 10,000 hours conceptually, you know, um, you know, you can help your players here develop more if you find opportunities to be successful with this elsewhere. And that, listen, that goes into nutrition advice. That goes into wholesome, where are the opportunities? Where's the low hanging fruit opportunities to, to get players to do more? Mm-hmm. And so within the, within the amateur structure as well, with those kind of warm-ups and opportunities to do things elsewhere, then you start bringing players in to maybe lead the warm-up, lead a part of it. So they become part of the learning culture. It's not just on us to do that. So um, bring them in to get, get doing, doing some of that stuff too. So the warm-ups give you a, a, an instant fast track to say, well, like, we're not doing a lot of sprinting right now because the coach is concerned about sprinting. But hey, yeah, but underpinning speed of these things so we get an opportunity in the warm-ups plus we're doing this in their own time as well mm-hmm. somewhere along the line the opportunity arises to have that to sit to spin off that opportunity to say hey speed some regular speed training might have helped that and you're sticking your neck out here so the winger pulls a hamstring yeah but he's already fast well um, part of the ability to express speed is not being super tired. Part of the ability to express speed is having good mechanics. And yes, part of the ability to express speed is having the fundamental force uh, application transmission abilities, which yes, we can do in the weight room, but we can also do in context here. The other opportunity is when the coach throws out a problem and motivational interviewing helped me with this in a chaotic environment of like there's a actually a little plea for help that you hear hey listen how how do we get to that breakdown quicker and you hey tell me more about that why is that a problem creates an opportunity for a discussion Mm -hmm. so one thing motivational interviewing taught me is always keeping your ears open for the opportunity to engage in that discussion and not, hey, I've got all the answers. We're so keen and enthusiastic to do our jobs. We want to give them the answer. Please avoid the expert trap. Mm. You seek that opportunity. And hey, tell me more about that. And then you kind of got that, that in. The other area for opportunities with this as well is like you watch them do some practices. And every head coach likes a bit of smoke blowing up their bottoms. Um, you know, hey, that was a brilliant agility practice. Oh, really? What do you mean by that? Hey, that was a great speed practice. You know, I mm. could really use that. Do you have more, more practices like that? Well, yeah. Could I, you've got them written. Can I have a conversation? You've got those written down anywhere? You're going to find a lot of the um, more in context, um, less decomposed drills and practices they've already been doing for years. So don't go thinking we've got to come in bringing them a bundle of new stuff. Sometimes the skill of the artist, right, isn't the first painting they make, it's the fifth or sixth one that they've thrown a lot away and come back with. Mm-hmm. If you can go straight to the masterpiece, why wouldn't you? And these coaches have so many drills and practices. So with Alan Irvin at Newcastle United, yes, a full-time academy, but I was only there for a few sessions a week. You know, uh, players' ability to close down, defend, jockey Harris back. You know, we come up with this little Y drill. You know that we would do simplified it first of all it was done without any visual stuff just to look at the basic movements you know then we start bringing a ball then we start bringing a player in then we turn it into multiple Y's added together and players moving around mm-hmm. and then it was in the game so a little bit of a you know part part whole approach yeah. but there's there are so many opportunities for for speed development if you take quite a broad lens and recognize it's what you can do in the warm-ups and talk about the underpinning abilities of speed, what you can do to get players to look for opportunities in their own time to enhance this skill and the ability, but then also to the head coach themselves. They're already doing a lot of stuff that you could classify and define probably as, as a speed development if you but we ourselves, we want the coach to be open-minded, let's be open-minded ourselves as well to the, the possibilities that exist for us. How might a how might a coach, let's talk about an SNC coach in an amateur setting, trying to get <clears throat> his guys or gals faster? What do you recommend in terms of tracking progress for 
the athletes? Are we looking primarily at shapes? Are we, you know, pulling out the phone, filming, trying to show them or trying to see some progress over time? Are we trying to actually track some, some data on, on speed metrics that we might be able to get now with, with a phone, with my sprint app or with gates, if we have them, but budgets are usually low depending on where you are. So what, what do you recommend the, the S and C coach go to in order to make sure that we're tracking what we're doing so that we can manage it better over time? So first of all, I think it starts with the nature of the problem you're trying to address. So if it's a game speed problem, it might not be as data quantifiable as we would like, but that's a conversation, mm. you know? Um, I remember working with a, with a fullback at Hartlepool and his goal was he wanted to block a higher percentage of, prop, of, of crosses. Mm -hmm. Great metric. That's a metric he come up with. There's another player who, he was a short central midfield player, and this isn't necessarily a sprinter, but he wanted to disrupt the, the oppos opposition's ability for flick on headers, mm. you know? So they couldn't direct him as well in the central midfield area, you know? So we had some basic rudimentary numbers. Not everything has to come from a textbook, come from the science. It can be stuff you develop there and then with that player, you know? Mm. So that's one thing. If it's a game situation, find game related metrics that you can you can assess and measure and man i've sat there with a clipboard rather than no videos and just looked at these you know before games are really getting videoed mm -hmm. and i tell you what even if your game is getting videoed still do that sometimes to go back to that uh, the basic raw methodology remember all technology has done has made it easier for us to acquire the information we're really trying to get with our eyes Mm. All right, and that we can't mm. always see. But sometimes we go back to that basics is good. Then on the flip side of that, then we want to go, have they got faster? You know? Um, so um, without technology, um, <laughs> an interesting little thing that I come up with, um, and it was somewhat based on a, on, a, on a test that Dean Riddle uh, came up with. I recognize that um, if I don't have... If I have a stopwatch, I can only time one person unless I've got a cohort of interns with me, right? So what really is speed? It's distance and time, right? So maybe what I've got to do is, is see how far they can get in a certain amount of time mm -hmm. rather than how, what the time is to go a certain distance. Mm -hmm. So I'd set up cones every two meters after something like maybe a 10 or 15 meter running. And this will change based on ages and stuff as well. So the first line of cones of 50 meters were green. The next were red, then they were yellow. Then I might go green, red, yellow. Mm -hmm. And it might be that I just would do a, a four second or a five second on a stopwatch. But by doing that, I can have a number of players lined up Okay, I know we got reaction time, response time. We know all that. Understand we know the, the issues around this, okay? It's crude, but it was effective because go, people sprint, stop. Once I see it on my clock, which cone did you pass, right? Mm -hmm. So I know in five seconds they got to the 22-meter line, right? It's crude. But in a group without timing systems, it works. Mm -hmm. It creates competition. So you're going to get a bigger intent than line up behind some timing gates. There's a line of 20 players. Right. I, literally later on, I started to run players in threes. Only one of them was in the timing gate. Right. So you'd run them in threes. So you had mm -hmm. that competition element. And for these guys, it was like a warm-up before they got into the real deal, yeah. so to speak, uh, as well. Um, so that was a really crude way of measuring speed. And that's probably the best that you've got. Now, we do know there's some good, great correlations, though, between acceleration and things like broad jump and vertical jump. Um, so you can easily set up, a, and again, part of my training practice with my team, because I didn't want testing to be a session. Testing occurred in sessions. So similar to like people lining up and, and, and sprinting, I would have my jump sessions, the rudimentary jumps and all those kind of things you'll learn from that. There's a free PDF on the rudimentary hop series mm -hmm. on the Altis right. website to look at that. But on days where I really want to express um, power, explosivity, 
the guy would have just have a cone in their hand. They would jump out as far as they could. They'd place their cone down. They'd walk back round, wait for their turn, go again. Now they've got the vision of that cone out in front of them. Mm -hmm. Do they try and jump a little bit better? Yes, they do. Right. If they improve, they move the cone forward. All right. I even started putting little sticky tape on their cones. I put their initials on. So when they left me to go, I got the tape measure out and I could measure those jumps, you know? Um, sometimes uh, as part of the indoor, like I mentioned the indoor warm-up sessions, you mm -hmm. know, I could, after a good warm-up, it might be, and I did this actually, I did use an octo jump at this time. I recorded jumps every single night for about two months. And I just looked at how the numbers changed. And I was basically able to, because we played on Sunday, sometimes Fridays, but essentially on a Wednesday, I could, I thought, we tell ourselves these stories that we know what we're doing. <laughs> I, um, I could see players that were probably not in a great state of recovery. Mm -hmm. I, could, I, I was able to narrow this down to one measurement on a Wednesday night, um, using the kind of the split between, you know, drop jump, cat movement jump, static jump stuff. Yeah. Because it was done, because players were kind of flowing in and doing their warm ups, it wasn't like everyone stand here, and get this done. I could, mm -hmm. it was easy to go, yeah, come on over, let's get this done. By this time, I'd set up an internship with a group called Sport 981, uh, who, who were great and also run the NASM certification. So these interns are paralleling their education through the, all the NASM stuff while getting a mentoring and practical experience of me at Sheffield Eagles as well. Mm -hmm. Plus I had Sheffield Hallam University students were able to come in and do some projects for me. So I could get them taking some of those jumps. But the cool thing was I could then retest only a small amount of players on the Friday before the Sunday game. Those that I identified that, you know, how's your recovery? So I wasn't necessarily getting everyone logging into a wellness check. Mm -hmm. That came a little bit later on. Um, but it was great to have that conversation with that player. And one of the guys was like, yeah, man, by three o'clock in the afternoon, I'm drained. Right? Opportunity for a nutrition discussion. Mm -hmm. Another player was like, you know, I just can't get my head into it when I get here. So everyone else was kind of starting with the foam rollers and that stuff. This guy, I got him out on the track. I just got him straight into dynamic stuff because mm -hmm. he needed a spark to get him going. Yeah. That was kind of interesting. I thought, oh, I could try this a few more. Some other, players. other guys, I'd go and put them on a, on a spin bike for six minutes First 10 seconds sprint, rest of it easy. So then come back to me. So I was able to start you know, tapping into what kind of got players up a little bit as well, just by listening and observing and sometimes being prepared to kind of, you know, break the protocol a little bit, think outside the box. Um, but listening to the player was kind of key there. I like what you said about organizing your sessions in a way that are convenient for what you have available, the tools that you have, the time that you have, mm -hmm the staff or non-staff that you have available with you. Are these things, realizations that you came up kind of on the fly? Do you sit down beforehand to try and plan those things? Or did you back then when you kind of came up with those ideas to try and organize your session as best as you could with what you had to get all the things you wanted out of it? How did you get to those kind of uh, maybe clever ways of organizing your training? You know, I'm, I'm like all of you guys out there, right? We, we massively over plan, right? <laughs> um, and you know I'd come away realized I'd got 50% of the session done mm -hmm. you know because reality hits right I mean you know we often talk about you know no plan survives first contact <laughs> but that's necessary still still plan yes you know do it try it and then you go oh that didn't quite work out and you know what it might not be down to you it might have been just the environment that night you know I mean like I said weather changes um, you're not in this space you're now in that space I think the, the ability to think on the fly is, is crucial, you know? Um, so I think what, what, that, what, is that, what that's based on is knowing your, your kind of goal for that night. What's the principle? What is my hierarchy again of what's important about tonight? Because if mm -hmm. things change, do what's important and you probably simplify it even more. And through that process of simplification, you go, actually, that's probably, I got more out of that than maybe what I'd planned. So that goes back to what you mentioned earlier, that ability to have that debrief with yourself. Mm -hmm. If at the end of the night or sometime in that week, plan that ability to look back at your, your session and replan that. So on my, my, my very rudimentary, you know, old Word doc kind of sheets that I used to print off and handwrite on, 
or um, like you said, after. I thought it was more important to write the session up after it had happened. Yeah. So, so my typing became right at what I actually did do. Mm-hmm. But in my little notes at the bottom, I'd say, hey, this originally was planned this way. Then I was able to clip the kind of paper handwritten copy with the what did happen. Because really the what did happen is more important, right? Because that's actually what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, you can, you can look at all your uh, effective training load design prior, but it doesn't matter if that isn't what happened. So yeah. it's more important to capture what actually did, did occur as well. Did I ask you a question there? I think I missed something, but. No, no, you did. That was good. And I, and I like your point about writing after the sessions. I actually started doing that this summer uh, through the preseason and after making little notes, even just small things on my phone on, oh, this portion was well-planned, executed fine. Let's move forward and we can, you know, we can reuse that. Or maybe this, this you know, section of the, the training, uh, I didn't actually get the guys to do what I wanted them to do initially. So I have to rethink my process and, and kind of zero back in on, on how to do it better or, oh, this is good, but how do we make it better next year? I think, like you said, the debrief after is, uh, I wouldn't say more important than the, the planning because you, you need to have a plan, but it's, it's just as important if you want to keep moving forward and not just stay static with, I'm going to write it down, I'm going to do it, and then, and then that's it. Yeah, you know, and um, I think as well, you know, having a, a young son at the time and then as a, you know, two sons, hey, do you want to come along and watch the players train tonight? <laughs> Get them on a camera. Mm. I, I, I mean, we talk about being documentarians and really I've been a terrible documentarian. In fact, I'm, I'm going out to a lot of my friends and colleagues out there and they're saying, hey, have you got any video or photos of stuff we've worked on? As I showed you earlier with my books, I've been very, very good at writing a lot of stuff down. Mm. But in our now day and age, that isn't what people need and want to see, right? So I wish I had more video and photos. I do have some, but, you know, get that, get that little Sherpa to come and help you around, you know, uh, who's going to be there with the camera. And, you know, that, for me, that was my boys a lot of the time who want to come along and see the players train and, and things too. But again, I wasn't, I wasn't fantastic at that because it is really good in reflection. Um, mm-hmm. to have some of those things uh, to build together. And, you know, again, everything is very context-driven because what I could do at Sheffield Eagles when they were part-time to what I could do with them when they were full-time, the principles were the same. I was just maybe able to expand a little bit on, on what we were doing. But now they were going from training three times a week to training five, six days a week. It's, it's always that increase in volume that you've got to cope with. Mm-hmm. You know, what I'm doing with the soccer team, with the rugby team, in principle... It's, people find this hard to accept. Every sport wants to feel they're special, but in, but in basics, it's very, very similar. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, my archer, when I was working in archery and swimming, completely different medium, okay, you're going to argue not so similar, but, when, but they're not team sports, right? A lot of the fundamentals of team sports, and I think J.B. Marin said this really well in the course, is that in team sports, you run. So you better be good at running. I think mm-hmm. someone even mentioned a little while ago, but the whole 10,000 steps, if you're taking 10,000 steps a day, how many of those are quality steps? You know, and that's not to say don't go out and walk, get out mm-hmm. there. You know, sometimes again, we just do what we can do. Our, our body is our best example of kind of self constraint and dynamic systems control as we know. Mm-hmm. Um, but if those movements and shapes you mentioned earlier, again, is it about the dates or the shapes? Um, injury history is a key indicator of that in your players, you know, um, Hamstring injuries are often not necessarily a problem with the hamstring itself, in my opinion. It's something, it's what else, where else in the body has particularly created that stress at that particular point in time. Mm-hmm. You know, typically muscles, whether it's a motor control coordination thing or an overload thing, is because something in the system hasn't quite connected up. Um, how do you address that? For team sports, um, I think that there's three kind of areas I look at. Uh, shoulder rotation, T-spine, anterior hip, and foot and ankle. Mm-hmm. Um, and in many ways, I, if I even have to narrow that down again, I go foot and ankle because it's the mm-hmm. thing that's striking the ground uh, yeah. as well. So it's lots of players, plantar flex, way too much on contact. If we can change that to here, and that's where your warm-ups help again. That's where the rudiment jumps and hops. So all this, I want to call it micro dosing of multiple things that are kind of geared towards the, solving the same sort of problem that you look at. You know, then you're going to have problems of, well, I've got a big group. How do I stratify them? How do I prioritize? Well, you can sometimes come in and say, hey, all you guys in line one, these players in line two, these players in line three. 
and you may actually back to some prior planning that's why i would have thought ahead of time is how do i get this over tonight so i, I would maybe stratify or categorize them in uh, different mailboxes as, mm -hmm. as dan pathanotis will talk about mailboxing so here here and here it's a start right it's it's better than giving everybody the same thing the players feel like you are addressing their thing and one of the very first opportunities I actually had to do this coming back from Canada after my master's and kind of getting into the sports performance world in the UK was with, was with a Super League team called Hull FC. John Keir was the head coach at the time. And my very good friend, Colin Sanctuary, would be a great guy for you to get on, who's now based out in Australia. Um, he had recommended me to John. And all they wanted me to do was come in and do speed. Um, so it was two times a week. Uh, Billy Madison, I think his name was the S&C coach there at the time. And so I have this problem. <laughs> We've got a track, not a field. It's on a track. Okay, so these guys ever run on track before? Am I going to cause more injuries that I'm solving? Mm -hmm. And they've all been told to buy spikes. <laughs> so what do I do? So again, it was setting up the presentation, trying to have some clarity of expectations. I'm like, hey, if you're not used to running in spikes, put them to one side for now. You know, I mean, there's issues obviously on track and wet weather, and this was, you know, um, North East Yorkshire in November, September time or whatever. Um, but then it was about how do I work with 35 players? So what I actually did do, I did video them over kind of naught to 30, and then I videoed them through 30 to 60. Now, going back to learning, that was when I realized that none of these players are going to reach top speed between 50 and 60. They're, they're bushed between 30 and 40, mm. right? But that was learning, right? All my mm. stuff, all my tracks that I've done with Stu prior in Calgary was that top speed's going to happen over here somewhere. No, 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 no. These guys, are, some of these guys are hitting top speed between 20 and 30, right? Mm. But at least I had some way of then classifying you know, what's their, what's their start like? What's their acceleration, their projection rise and rhythm in that first part? Is it okay or does it suck? Well, if it sucks, they're in this group. I don't even care what the top ends do, right? Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. Is it okay and they've got a good transition to top speed? Okay, there's group B. Is it okay but their top speed transition sucks? All right, there's my group C. So while those generic things I was able to do, I was then able to separate them out and set up some different parts. So again, that was prior preparation mm. um, to look at the problem, set some sessions up, go in with a plan, but still recognizing that that could change uh, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of an overview, I guess, of a, something of a framework and how I try to put these things together in that part time. Or, I mean, part time coming as a full time team like Hull or Newcastle mm -hmm. Academy, I'm just in there on a, I'm not around all the time versus what strictly is just a just an amateur part time environment. Yeah, you, your last point dovetails nicely into what I wanted to go next, which is sprinting technique and how we might look at it in the context of amateur field sports. Uh, they're not elite sprinters, they don't do this for a living. So, how good should we expect them to look? Uh, when they're sprinting what should what should be the main things that we look at uh, as amateur or coaches in amateur settings in order to not just you know try to make them the perfect sprinter which there shouldn't they shouldn't be anyway and they probably will never be because because of you know who they are and where they are uh, and everything that came before and everything that comes after yeah so you're right it's about setting your your bandwidth of acceptability and um the first one, I think, is um, look at injury history. And, um, you know, are, are they being exposed to um, situations where we're potentially increasing that by the way they move? Mm. Now, again, we know the body is a very um, um, managerial thing. It will probably down-regulate that anyway in training. The stress of a game, it probably won't downregulate that, you know. But mm -hmm. players are very, very good, I think, at self-modulating their input, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. Um, so sometimes, again, in the warm-ups, great time to observe, especially when you're giving players that freedom. Where do they go to themselves? Mm -hmm. Hey, 
that's an area you seem to go to a lot. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's bothering me. So you can, don't just focus in on a sprint session. Look at the whole picture, I guess is what I'm saying. Pick mm. up different pieces that are helping you tell a story about that player. Um, so that's one area you can pick that up in. So first of all, you know, is what they're doing going to be harmful? That's, that's the key thing. Now, again, it might not just be in their shape. They're over fatigued. They're underprepared. You know, maybe it is the strength room that can help with that sort of stuff. Again, game first approach. Is it important that they're the best upright runners in the world or in rugby? You know, it might not be, right? Mm -hmm. You know, guy diving, you know, picking up a low ball, running, hitting low into that rock. You know, it's, it's different things, right? But we do know if he casts out in front while he's doing that, you know, it, it might be an issue, right? That he's mm -hmm. casting out and landing on the heel, for example, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, watching your uh, taller, bigger players uh, in acceleration, stepping from side to side. Or their, or their initiation movements being a lateral step but over wide because they're so big upper body, in their brain, they're going to topple. Mm -hmm. So getting comfortable with them staying over there, the necessary base of support. I mean, I was even watching an NFL last night, you know, um, they're talking about the quarterbacks and how they skip, skip, and all of a sudden there's a big wide base of support and they lose the power in the throw. Mm -hmm. Just watching, watching for how people kind of um, self-regulate uh, their base positions before they move um their transitional patterns can can be kind of telling as well um and so i think first of all is don't do any harm is the number one thing the number two thing then is will it change the game for them will it improve them as a player um you know and you know what we tend to find and having a great conversation with matt price from the la kings just the other day is that They've had so much time, and I know this is a professional area era uh, team, but they have so much time, their off-season to do on-ice speed work. All their slower players have got a hell of a lot faster mm. in content-driven practices. Yeah. You know, their fast guys that they know are fast haven't got faster. Shock horror, right? But it's kind of kept, kept them topped up, you might say. So mm. the other thing to think about around your players is, um, and Steve Norris gave me this kind of, thing i think dan Kleder talks about it in his book as well it's like what are we trying to tax on the day i really push the energetic limits and demands of that particular aspect mm -hmm. so if it's speed we know we're going to push them neurally we are going to push them energetically in terms of the atp pc and lactate system and one of the biggest problems in speed development is often we make it an endurance workout not a speed workout um and thirdly is tissue tolerance mm -hmm. you know so um in observing your players training and playing, they might be fast for three, but then what's stopping them do four or five? Is it tissue tolerance? They go, yeah, I start to feel a bit sore on my hamstrings or my calf. I feel my calves get sore after this practice. Sometimes, unfortunately, the bad things you pick up in your sessions, like a cl player always start to get a really tight, sore lateral gastrocs. Probably a good sign they're a big plantar flexor, mm. you know, or they get really sore in the medial gastrocs. Again, probably a good sign that they go from here and they can't control the deceleration, you know, into pronation very, very, uh, yeah, into pronation very, very well as well. So sometimes that if you don't overcook the session by just maybe training or touching upon these things and mo modifying your volume, you're going to get feedback and, and encourage that feedback. So I, I need to hear this because this is going to give us some indication of maybe where your weak links in the system are. Mm -hmm. um, we know we're all going to lose end of the day. So watching the warm-ups, setting sessions that you don't overcook, but get some feedback from. You might even get that from just jump sessions. Players are like, oh, my calves are so sore after that. Oh, my glutes are so sore. My back was achy. Hey, how come after doing all that, my shoulders are tight and sore? You know, you just get that kind of feedback from players, um, which will then, I think, will, will help you kind of direct that. So these are, are all kind of the underpinning content elements of, of uh, what's going to help someone be, be faster. And again, we've got to remember, as you said, a track athlete, their job is to run on a track and go there. Mm -hmm. So their context is the content that we're, some, we're looking at in our team sport players mm -hmm. you know um 
whether it's ice hockey, whether it's rugby, whether it's soccer, you know, that initial acceleration, start, projection, rhythm and rise, they're all applicable. Mm -hmm. Just there's gradients of those things we're looking for. You know, where the foot strikes, there's gradients. One of the really simple practices that I did um, with my rugby guys, and I'm going to use the ladders here, and ladders, forget about ladders, and I mentioned them. But if you have the ladder and you have rung one or space one, space two, space three, and progressively in your warm up, which is another thing, at the end of it now, you go, right, you're going to actually accelerate from space three, then space two, then space one. What does it do? It progressively means their start position is more upright. Mm -hmm. So I've used that quite a lot, just a video of that, to look at their projection angles all right, and their, their, their rhythm as they go out and their mm -hmm. rise by looking at what does that first step entail. Because you know your forwards, often they're receiving the ball a lot in upright positions. You know? So clearly I'm not going to get my forward to grab a ball and do this. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> It ain't gonna happen, right? It's not what happens mm. in the game. Mm. But you can definitely look at that. That do they catch it because they're upright? Are they prepared to do this to project themselves, or do they reach out? Mm. Really simple thing to fix, you know. Mm. Um, that that's that's really simple to fix. That can make a big impact again in terms of your collision angle into the players trying to stop you as well. Versus I'm here and I'm gonna step out in front rather than I'm just going to get my body over and then you know, and go together. What a big difference that can make, you know? Mm. So I do think shapes, there's some simple shapes like that, I say simple, that you can identify that if that player consistently is stepping out, A, they're putting themselves in a really poor collision situation to lead to injury. B, they're stepping out, so they're putting a lot of stress, obviously, back on that knee and the hamstrings. Mm. And if they get actually hit in that position with that foot out, then we've got an ACL situation, mm. you know, just by simply getting them to receive the ball in an upright position and learn how to do this, just project and go and keep their feet striking in the right patterns underneath them. So they're the situation I think that yeah, that's, I feel that's a super important scenario that we can work on. They're not perfect. It's not, you know, like we say, it's not at the amplitudes or the regulation we're going to see, but but without me knowing those principles from track, I probably wouldn't have come to that solution or way of trying to manage that specific problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's, 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 it's really practical advice and, and I hope it, it brings some value to the people listening. Nick, I know we have just a few more minutes for today's call. Um, I do want to note that uh, you are coming back on in the next few days to do another show, especially focused on the Need for Speed course that you guys at Altis have recently put out. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic. So for people who are interested, stay tuned because Nick is coming back really soon to talk about this. To finish here today, I wanted to go on a few uh, questions that we got from the good old Instagram. So the first one, um, I've brought in the question just a little bit. Uh, the person was asking about sports, Spelman performance uh, by, by soccer. Um, so, and let's try and keep it under, I'm going to challenge you. Let's keep every, every answer from now on under two minutes if we can. Um, different sports, different approaches, rugby, soccer, American football. Uh, with those three sports in mind, how would you organize speed training? Say you have one session, maybe two sessions a week. Uh, how would you differentiate between those three sports and the approaches you take? Um, okay, so first of all, game first approach, athlete first approach, and then organize your hierarchy of KPIs. Mm -hmm. So differentiate that. American football, football, um, not an endurance based sport. Rugby, soccer, lots of endurance. So you have to account for within the week what's going on in terms of endurance demands under these players as well. Mm -hmm. um, soccer has way more decelerations. Um, obviously football and rugby has way more collisions mm -hmm. um, where you're going into contact or they might say you're trying to avoid contact as the attacker, um, not always, um, but, but as the defending player, obviously you're trying to instigate, instigate some kind of contact as well. Mm -hmm. um, needs analysis of the sports, um, you know, go away, do your research, look at the movement patterns in those sports, understand where, where, you know, what is speed in that sport. Um, we'll get into that on the next session about subcomponents. Understand, again, your hierarchy of KPIs, what might be the most important aspects of those. 
Um, and then are there any you know, player positional demands that might be, you know, you need to focus on more? You know, what are the opportunities for top speed in those games? Um, and again, relative top speed, not, not based on some kind of absolute measurement as well. Um, look at the injury history, not just within the sport, but within the team as well. Are there any mm. things that might flag there within those two different, uh, those three different sports that might have some uh, idea of, there might be some speed mechanistic um, issues that are going on within those sports as well. Um, football and rugby tend to be all in that direction. Soccer is multi-directional. So again, you have other components. Look at the practices. What are the coaches already doing? What's missing? Hmm. So sometimes the gap analysis. What is missing? Of those things that's missing, what's important based on my list of KPIs? Go and do that. I like that. I like the gap analysis. That's something I'd, I'd never heard before, but it, it makes a lot of sense considering we have pretty much, we pretty much have to plug in what we do into the sports practice or around it. So it makes a lot of sense to look at what is already done and then what we can add to it. Um, next question, Dave asks, and you've probably answered somewhat, but I'll let you give a direct answer to that. Dave asks, best bang for your buck exercise a session to increase speed and acceleration. Um, I think I'll take a Dan John quote, right? The <laughs> best way to get strong is lift heavy things often. So the best way to get fast is do fast things often. Of course, many caveats are many, it depends. Yes. Um, too many of us, I think, as strength conditioning coaches, uh, we go to live in our hobbit hole, the gym, and we don't get out of it. Mm. Um, however, if that's all you have, research what underpins acceleration of speed components. We know force. So let's, can we develop force? All right. And again, we tend to stick with the, you know, the big three, the deadlifts, the squats, the cleans. Great. Where's some single leg expression? When, where can we develop that in the weight room as well? Hmm. But again, if you want to be fast, because it's a skill, there's huge coordinative elements in there. You know, you may not access or utilize all that gym strength out here. In fact, you could even be someone who doesn't have the gym strength, but is better at organizing all this. Therefore, you're quicker. Mm. Right. And, and mm. we'll talk about a number of fast athletes that probably have never seen a weight room in their life. And in fact, they'll probably snap them in two, but they actually yes. generate huge, huge high forces, right? So mm. we can't get away from the fact that sprinting is not just an ability, it's also a skill. Uh, last question here for you today, Nick. Uh, Sivari asks, how to choose or use running drills with large groups who have different individual needs in the same session? So I think you have to um, go back to your KPIs and, and come up with, for your sport, um, what are the critical shapes and aspects that you're looking at? So again, are you looking at acceleration or top end speed? Are we looking at acceleration into deceleration? Um, so I've mentioned you know, foot and ankle position, uh, hip position, and then maybe some shoulder thoracic rotation areas. Um, you can... Um, mailbox your players based on those mm. and then you would stratify them in your warm-up or your session accordingly if you're doing a field-based technical based uh, element for that as well um, so over here i might have people who might be going into some mini hurdle you know maybe doing some a marches skips and some mini hurdle hops and you know i'll get them going into a gentle acceleration you know over here i might have two players who are working with the ball you know, and then a pass one come, they've got a break, mm. you know, so you're looking at movement in transition. So mailboxing is, is the answer there. Uh, identify your KPIs, organize your groups accordingly, plan something maybe slightly different for them, and then be consistent with that over a two or three week phase. Um, that was all the questions for you today, Nick. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was really a great pleasure to, to, Thanks, to ex Sean. exchange with you and, and learn from you. Like I said uh, previously, uh, guys, stick around, guys and gals, stick around because uh, we are going to have a follow-up episode to talk specifically about the Need for Speed course that was recently put out by Altis. In the meantime, Nick, where can people find out more about you online? So uh, I am on Instagram at uh, nwarder UK. Also Twitter, I tend to use more for my professional stuff at Nick Ward UK. And of course, we have the Altis website um, with a bundle of free resources on there. www.altis.world um, is a great location for some great resources. 
I'll link all of those in the podcast description for people to click on and go check out. Nick, thanks again for today and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Take care, Sean. Thank you.